right, today is lecture 32. Friday is our exam, 720, and we are going to spend most of the time reviewing here. Though what I want to do is I want to review in the context of the example we've been looking at the last couple of times with Laurent series. We've got one more Laurent series I want to find for this function. Again, the function being z over z squared plus z minus 12, which is the same as z over z plus 4 times z minus 3, which if you explain in terms of partial fractions, let's remind ourselves what the answer was, I forgot. There it is, uh, 4 sevenths over z plus 4 plus 3 sevenths over z minus 3. 4 sevenths over z plus 4 plus 3 sevenths over z minus 3. There's one more kind of Laurent series expansion for this function that I want to find. Again, the poles are at negative 4 and 3, and those poles do have to be poles of order 1. We saw it for the uh, one at negative 4 last time, the one at 3 is of order 1 as well. The reason being, if you expand the Laurent series, for example, about negative 4, in a punctured disk centered at negative 4 or radius 7, then the most negative power of z plus 4 in the Laurent expansion is negative 1 power. And that's why we say it has order 1. The same kind of thing would happen if we expanded in a Laurent series in a punctured disk centered at 3 with a radius of 7 that we would call it like that. Once again, the Laurent series expansion, the most negative power of z plus 3 would be negative 1. And that would be the order of the polar at 3 is 1. The last Laurent series expansion I want to find here is one centered at negative 4, but not a punctured disk centered at negative 4, but instead um, the outside of the disk centered at negative 4, a disk of radius 7. So here's a disk of radius 7. I'd like to expand f of z in the Laurent series in the set outside that disk, the open set outside that disk, still centered at negative 4. Okay, I didn't make the disk perfectly, but just pretend this is a disk centered at negative 4 with radius 7. Let's look at the outside of that disk. Um, as far as the partial fraction expansion goes, we don't really need to do anything with that part. That already represents this term outside, well, take away the point at negative 4, everything but negative 4 can already be represented by that for this part of the partial fraction expansion. So I don't need to do anything with this part. It's already its own series in powers of z plus 4. So the only thing I need to work with is this, is this part here. Let's come do that over on this side. 3 sevenths over z minus 3. How am I going to get this to converge to something outside this disk of radius four, uh, radius 7 centered at negative 4? Negative 4 here. <clears throat> well, if I try getting it in terms of powers of z plus 4 over 7, seven say, positive powers of that, like I did last time, that would converge inside the disk of radius 7, so centered at negative 4. So instead I want to get it in terms of powers, positive powers of the reciprocal of that, maybe. 7 over z plus 4. I can do the same kind of thing that I've done before. Add 4 and subtract 4 and write it like that in the bottom. So now I have a z plus 4 there, that's good. But to get it in terms of positive powers with geometric series here, to get it in terms of positive powers of something over z plus 4, it's going to be 7 over z plus 4. Instead of factoring out a negative 7, I should factor out a z plus 4 on the bottom. What's left over after I do that? Well, with the z plus 4, I know 1 is left over. And with a negative 7, it's a negative 7 over z plus 4 left over. I 
I've got one minus the common ratio there in the bottom for the geometric series formula. And that thing is going to, you know, the series is going to converge when the modulus of 7 over z plus 4 is less than 1, which is equivalent to the modulus of z plus 4 being greater than 7. What about the 3 sevens and the z plus 4 up on the bottom here? I could bring the z plus 4 up to the top there, next to the 7. I could also just put it in front, say. That's something else I could do. I mean, I could have it in top. It is the A for a geometric series. Let's not use the formula for the geometric series. A, the first term is going to be 3, seven, three over 7 times z plus 4. The second term is going to be a times the common ratio, 7 over z plus 4. The next term is going to be, again, the a, the first term, 3 over 7 times z plus 4 times the common ratio quantity squared. And again, that's going to converge when the modulus of z plus 4 is bigger than 7. When z is further, is more than 7 units away from negative 4. And then you can simplify a little bit. And let me maybe write this in terms of negative powers. 3 7 times z plus 4 to negative 1. Plus, simplifying a bit, 3 times z plus 4 to the negative 2. The 7 is canceled. Next term, one of the sevens cancels. You get uh, left with the seven up top times three is 21 times z plus four to the negative three. And you can see the pattern. You're gonna keep multiplying by seven times z plus four to the negative one. The next term would be seven times 21 is 147. 147 z plus four to the negative four, et cetera. That's not the final answer though, right? That's just for this part. Now I have to add this thing to it. But that's already a power of z plus 4, so I don't need to do anything with it. So the final answer is going to add that with 4 sevenths, which is going to make the negative 1 power of z plus 4 be a, like a coefficient of 1. 3 sevenths plus 4 sevenths. And the final answer then will be the same thing where the first term has a coefficient of one. So it's technically no longer a geometric series because the first term doesn't match the pattern of the geometric series. But after that point, it's a geometric series. That's an expansion for the original function that converges outside the disk of radius 7 centered at negative 4 in the open domain outside that disk. Okay? If you haven't taken the time to practice more problems with Laurent series expansions beyond the regular journal completion homework, uh, it's getting close to your last chance to do so before the test here on Friday. So, yeah, look, look up more examples. There's some video. You know, I, I looked up Laurent series on YouTube, and there are plenty of videos out there with more examples. So, that would be good to do. And, it, and if you're watching some video with more examples, when they show you the example, try to figure it out what they're going to do before they do it, and then hopefully they'll do it, and, and you can check your answers. All right, let's think of these terms, things in terms of integration as well. And in doing so, we will review at the same time. So we're going to go back to chapter four. I think with the exam on, on Friday, I think it is appropriate to pretty much include all of chapter four. So before the Cauchy Gorsoff theorem. So you should be able to parameterize curves, for example, paths. Contours, there are all those different names for the same thing essentially. You should be able to 
to integrate with the parameterization, you should be able to um, use an antiderivative of the integrand, if, if there is one, over the domain. In addition to cauchy gorsa cauchy integral formula, that kind of stuff. So I, I do want you to pretty much review all of chapter four. And then now, basically, the first six sections of chapter five is what we did for chapter five. <clears throat> It'll be good to review that anyway, to remind yourself of everything, and that'll be good to review for the final exam, which is, uh, which day of finals week? Thursday. Thursday. Finals week is late this year. <clears throat> That's like the 25th, is that right? Yeah. 25th of May, wow, well, okay. That's only three weeks away. I know that it's late in May, but um, it's, it's not a bad idea to review all of chapter four here. <clears throat> Continuing with this example. Let's go ahead and have our contour our closed contour would be, well, in the domain that I just found these Laurent series expansion for. By the way, this Laurent series expansion that converges in this domain is not the expansion to use to prove the order of the pole at negative 40 to 1. Even though, okay, for one thing, you have infinitely many powers with negative, negative powers. So yeah, that doesn't correspond to the pole having order to 1 you have to focus on the Laurent series expansion in a puncture disk centered at negative 4. The disk of radius 7, interior to that disk, except for negative 4, that's the domain on which the Laurent series expansion tells you the order of the pole. <clears throat> uh, but let's, yeah, let's go ahead and have our contra B in this domain, and let's keep it simple, let's make it a circle of radius 8, say, centered at negative four, <coughs> capital gamma. Probably if we were going to use a parameterization, it would be too hard. I mean, mathematically, we saw last time, we could probably do it. But this kind of example would be too hard for a parameterization. But you should be able to set it up. If I, ask, I, mean, I, I could ask you to just set it up. You know, what is Z of T? What is the integrand ultimately? Z of t for that contour, the simplest thing to do would be to take negative 4 plus 8 e to the rt. Just realizing that that's a complex parameterization of that circle of radius 8 centered at negative 4 is an important thing to do, to realize that that's the case. <coughs> And you'd need to plug it into the function. Certainly plugging it into the function is not too hard. And multiply by z prime. Simplifying that, <coughs> simplifying that could be a big pain. <coughs> Excuse me. To tell you the truth, if I were going to do it completely by hand, if I were going to attempt it, I think I'd probably use the partial fraction version of it seems simpler because you've got linear things instead of quadratics. That would be my inclination is to use that. Let's just get as far as we feel like getting and just see if it seems probably too hard or not. So the, the integrand for the complex integral would be f of z of t times z prime of t. Let me use the partial fraction expansion. We're at 4 sevenths over z plus 4, plugging in this for z. The 4s will cancel, that's nice, I guess. Right, plugging that in for z and calculating z plus 4. The 4s will cancel, and you'll be left with a to e to the it. It's not going to cancel with the other one. You got 3 sevenths over z minus 3, plug this in for z, negative 4 minus 3 is negative 7, you're going to get negative 7 plus 8 e to the it. 
then don't forget to multiply by z prime a i e to the i t. Certainly multiplying this by that term would result in something nice. <coughs> What's well, 8 times 4? So the 8's canceled, and the e to the i t's canceled. Looks like you're left with um, 4 sevenths i e to the i, uh, no, no e to the i t. 4 sevenths i. <coughs> right? Does that look good? Tell me if I make a mistake. Multiply by this one, and it doesn't simplify quite so nicely. Uh, you get 24 over 7i e to the it up top, over negative 7 plus 8 e to the it. And this would be the thing to integrate from 0 to 2pi. Integrating that piece would be easy. It's a constant. You get 4 sevenths i times 2pi. Integrating that, maybe not so much. Does that make a mistake? Would that be negative 4 sevenths i? Um, no, the i is on top here. Yeah, okay, thanks. Integrating that doesn't look so easy. Is it possible? Evidently, because Mathematica was doing these last time. Um, my inclination is maybe trying a substitution might make this integral possible to do. Maybe by you know, you know, u or w, whatever you want to use, e negative 7 plus 8 e to the it, du would be, differentiate this, 8i e to the it dt, and you've almost got the u there. So I think the answer is going to be doable. It didn't involve a whole logarithm. You might wonder whether it's valid because we're using complex numbers. But I think it would be doable. I won't make you do something like this on the exam as far as an integral go, unless I give you a lot of help. Um, but I might have you just simplify the integrand to that and not just ignore that's what you would do. Can we predict the answer? Um, at the end of class on Monday, we did integrate on Mathematica over a circle like this, but it was actually a different function. Where I had the square here, and we got zero. Do you remember that? This one, you don't get zero. Can we predict what we would get? Well, remember, here's the Laurent series expansion for this function. Valid outside the distal radius 7, it's under negative 4. So we should be able to integrate this term right now. Which sounds difficult until you remember that all the integrals are going to be zero except one of them. Except that one. <coughs> and the integral of that one, you should probably have memorized by now, would be what? 2 pi. 2 pi i. Right? We've said that before. Integrate z minus z0 to the negative 1 power over some, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a circle, some simple closed contour going around z0. You're going to get 2 pi i. I have some other power there, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, or 0, or 1, or 2, or 3, or 4. You get 0. Even though with the negative 2 power, negative 3 power, you still are only analytic on the entire plane except for, the, for z0, those integrals end up being 0. So the answer should be 2 pi i. The integral, just that piece. Okay, let's have Mathematica see if that's the case. This, this thing here. Here is, here is the answer for the series we got on the punctured disk. And this negative one being the most negative power of z plus 4 was what guaranteed on that punctured disk that the order of the pole is 1. What about for modulus of z plus 4 greater than 7? It's this thing in blue. 
How about integrating it? Let's put it underneath here. I'll go ahead and use the same parameterization I wrote over on the left side of the board there. I have entered F. Now that I can write the integram like that. <coughs> okay, integrate that from 0 to 2 pi. We should get 2 pi i. This is a little bit of review, how to parameterize and find the integrand. What else can we review? We can review the Cauchy integral formula here with the same example. Let me write, write the generalized version down. You've got some function, <coughs> excuse me, analytic at some point z0, which really means it's analytic in some neighborhood of z0, some open disk centered on z0. And you've got a simple closed contour going around z0. It doesn't have to be a circle, but inside the domain where f is analytic. The nth derivative of f at z0 and when n is 0, by the way, that means the function itself, the 0th derivative is defined to be the function itself. So this formula includes the, the ordinary Cauchy angle formula. When n is 0, you get n factorial over 2 pi i times the integral over gamma f of z divided by z minus z0 to the n plus 1 power. That means nth derivative. First derivative, n would be 1. Second derivative, n would be 2. Yes, zero derivative. That means the function. So this formula does include that case. Zero factorial is 1. Zero plus 1 is 1. In fact, with this example, all we can do is the case where n is 0. With the other example that I mentioned a few minutes ago, we could do the case where n is 2. Or excuse me, 1. Go back to the original function, and let's look at it in this form, actually. Think about how could we use the Cauchy integral formula to help us evaluate the integral of this function. I'm still talking about the same, well, no, I'm not going to talk about the same domain, because um, f is not analytic completely inside that domain, even if f is like z over z minus 3. Let's focus on some contour like this, going around negative 4. F is analytic <coughs> on and inside that contour, except in negative 4. And if I define a new function, g of z to be z over z minus 3, that new function is analytic on and inside that contour everywhere, including at negative 4. Why did I pick z over z minus 3? Because it's related to the original function. The original function, oh, that doesn't work very well. Did I try to turn it away? Is there garbage over there? Is that over there? over your head, though. Oh! Oh! Almost? Almost okay. empty in. The original function is this g of z function divided by z plus 4. Divided by z minus negative 4, z minus z0. The original function integrated over this gamma that I just drew 
can be thought of as the integral of g of z divided by z minus 4, where g of z is the function I just defined, which by the Cauchy integral formula, if you take the case where n is 0 and multiply both sides by 2 pi i, this will be 2 pi i times g of what? I made a mistake here, didn't I? That's my mistake. Yeah, z minus minus 4 or z plus 4, yeah. That's my mistake. z0 is negative 4. The answer should be 2 pi i times g of negative 4. 2 pi i, what is g again? g is z over, I guess I have it here, z over z minus 3. So this is negative 4 over negative 4 minus 3. Negative 4 over negative 7 is positive 4 sevenths. Positive 4 sevenths times 2 is positive 8 sevenths. It looks like this is 8 sevenths. Pi i, I. Does that look good? Let's check it. I'm really integrating the original function. I have to define the new function in order, in order to use the Cauchy integral formula. Let's go ahead and pick a circle. Actually, you can see the answer come from that right away. 4 7 times 2 pi i. Right, that's your negative 1 power. This expansion is good on this puncture disk. For extra insurance, let's do the parameterization. I won't bother simplifying the uh, integrand. Okay, so this should be 8 pi i over 7 or 8 sevens times pi i. Oops, I used the wrong. I could use a 2 here, for example, or a 3, or a 1, or anything between 0 and 7. That was my question. How, like, what are the gammas that that will work? Yeah, uh, let's think about that. You can think about that in terms of the continuous deformation theorem. <coughs> As long as you continuously deform this contour gamma in such a way that you don't pass through a pole, the answer is going to be the same. So if I'm talking about circles, I can make the circle up to, but not equal to, a radius of 7. Once the radius gets past 7, then the answer could be different as it was. You don't want to do a radius of 7 because then you're going to go through the pole. The function is undefined. Or I suppose it, there could be an issue of does, could you think of it in terms of improper integrals and does the improper integral converge? I suppose that could be an issue. That may be an improper integral like that could converge. But we're not going to think about that at all. Yeah, and you, and you can have a little fun with this. What is this answer approximately? It's about point, uh, neg uh, point excuse me, 3.59i. You can even have a little fun with this, about what kind of fun am I talking about. You can even add a little bit of maybe wiggle to the parametric curve. What do I mean? Well, I don't know. Multiply, multiply this part by, <coughs> or maybe I should add, no. I don't know. Multiply it by cosine. 10t, uh, I'm not trying to do here. Let's make it a small amplitude cosine. 0 0.1 cosine 10t plus 0 0.1, okay? You know, what, what would that look like as a parametric curve? I'd have to graph its real and imaginary parts. 
the parametric plot. Uh, let's see, copy paste <coughs> the rescue. Well, it does that sometimes with the decimals that are hidden, so to speak. That was not that was unexpected. I did not expect that to happen. Uh, hmm. It's pretty. It's pretty. I did not expect that to happen though. Let's see. I thought I, I thought it was making these wiggles small enough in a sense. Maybe I just need to add this instead of multiplying. There we go, a little bit of wiggle to it. That's what I wanted. And now, probably if I try to do the integral with the symbolic integral, probably I can't do it. It's probably going to spin its wheels and either keep running without giving an answer or it's going to give up at some point. Yeah, well, it's still running. It's probably just too hard, maybe impossible to do symbolically. It's aborted here. Uh, we could do an integrate though. Numerical integration. What are we hoping the answer is going to be close to? We're hoping it's going to be close to 3.59i. Could it be a little off? I don't know, maybe because of numerical error. Though I doubt it. I, I bet it's the same for that in decimal places. Okay, we are getting a little numerical error here in the real part. Real tiny amount of numerical error. That, that should be a zero. Okay, so there's a little extra emphasis. It doesn't have to be a circle. Um, what if we wanted to use the generalized Cauchy integral formula? Let's really do that in a more general form when n is not zero, like one. I'd have to modify the example here. It's not going to be my original example. Let's go back to that modified example. Let's make this z plus four squared, which we did look at on Monday, and we saw the integral over such a circle as what's in blue here was zero for that example. Let's Let's confirm it's zero, evidently, with the Cauchy integral formula, too. That was the example, I think. That's the example we did, but we got zero. Um, so how am I going to use the Cauchy integral formula with that thing? I have to modify, well, my g of z is going to be the same. this blue circle. My g of z is still z over z minus 3. g of z is playing the role of f of z in this formula, by the way, if that wasn't clear. I'm dividing by z minus negative 4 squared, so n would be 1. One is two. One factorial is still one, so I effectively still multiply both sides by just two pi i, and I multiply times the derivative of, in this case, the g at negative four. So we need to find the derivative of g. Don't forget the quotient rule. You might need it. Low d high minus high below over the square of what's below. This is a minus sign here. d 
The z's on top look like they cancel. We got negative three all over z minus three quantity squared. Was the answer zero? Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm remembering some a different example. Doesn't look like the answer is going to be zero right here. It looks like it's going to be two pi i g prime of negative four, which is not going to be zero. I must be thinking of a different example. Two pi i g prime of negative four, plug negative four in there. Negative four minus three is negative seven. Negative seven squared is forty nine. Negative three forty ninths. That's the answer, we do 6 pi i for 49. How does this look to people? Any mistakes you see? I just have a question. Why the gamma on the blue? Uh, the bigger one, the blue. Okay. So I'm, oh, that's the problem. You, you, you put your finger on the problem. No, I mean going around negative 4 here. So the g of z is analytic on and inside the curve. <clears throat> it's easy to get mixed up with what we're doing, so we've got to keep track. Okay, So we are doing a curve like this to get this answer. Maybe the integral over the blue one is zero. Um, let's con confirm this answer. So we never use that formula if it goes outside the pole. It's got, it's got a, the, the numerator has to be analytic on and inside the So let's see. A different, it's a different function. It's g of z. Actually, I have g of z down here. And I guess we, we already did this, didn't we? There's the answer. We did this on Monday. With this g of z, it goes to the square there. Ah, which is a different g of z than I used for g of z in the problem. I should probably call this h of z. That's the engram. You integrate it, you get what we predicted for the answer. Negative 6 pi i over 49. Down here further, we did get an answer of 0 over a circle that's like the blue one. Negative 4 plus 8 e to the i t. I bet that means if we integrated around a circle of radius less than 7 around 3 instead of negative 4, I bet the answer is the opposite of this one. Positive 6 pi i over 49, so they cancel, so to speak, when we go around a bigger circle. And actually, the book does give you arguments for why that should be the case back in chapter 4. <laughs> earlier in chapter 4 in the section about the Cauchy, Cauchy Dorsal theorem. Um, you did the reading and, and read about breaking up integrals over things like this into pieces. Maybe using the continuous deformation theorem. If you think about this blue curve, you can continuously deform it to a really it's sort of like a barbell kind of thing. One going around one, negative 4, one going around 3. You can break it up into sort of the integral over this combined contour and add the results, and the results have to give you the answer over the blue one, which was zero. So yeah, the integral over a circle like this is going to have to be positive 6 pi over 49. Let's see if that happens. Uh, we are talking about for this modified function here, this h of z. So let's change the parameterization to being centered at 3 instead of negative 4. 
I can take the radius to be 1 or anything less than 7. Integrate this thing, we should get positive 6 pi i over 49. And we do. As you are trying examples on your own, you know, don't be afraid to do the exact same kind of stuff I'm doing here with Mathematica to, to double check things. Confirm that you're thinking about it right, though it's easy to make mistakes like I've been I've been making mistakes sometimes, so it's good you guys are catching me. I think it would also be appropriate to make sure you recall the interpretation of integrals in terms of ordinary line, line integrals from multivariate calculus. <coughs> I'm sort of, in my review here, I'm sort of skipping, well, I am skipping some other stuff you should know that would include things like. Leoville's theorem, fundamental theorem of algebra, maximum modulus principle, and simpler examples with Taylor series. And you should make, definitely practice the long series more. So I'm not really paying much attention to those today, but I think I'm paying attention to what is more important as far as some other things you should review. Um, using Sloppy notation. F of D D Z can be thought of as U plus I V times DX plus I D Y. This is the quickest way to recover the real and imaginary parts of the complex integral if you forget it. Multiply this, you know, can you really multiply dz's times the f of z's and dx's and dy's? Well, not really. You're not literally doing a multiplication, but symbolically it works out to pretend like you're multiplying. The real part's going to be u dx from first times first. Last times last also gives you a real answer because i squared is negative 1. iv times i dy is negative v dy. That's the real part of this expression. The imaginary part goes next to the i, comes from outside and inside products. i times u dy and i times v dx. Put the one with the dx first. v dx plus u dy. In terms of vector symbolism and dot products, you could write this as u negative v, that vector field, dotted with dx comma dy plus i v comma u, that vector field, dotted with dx comma dy. And the contour integral, the line integral for this thing, is the sum of two real line integrals with an i in there. The integral of f of z over some contour that does not have to be closed. Did I use a ds or a dr? Sometimes I use ds. Did I use an s? Okay. Sometimes you use a dr. That's something you should know for the test. Uh, notationally, sometimes I call this thing uv bar because it's kind of like a complex conjugate. Put the negative sign in front of the second thing. And for this thing, I also, on the exam two from four years ago, at least I didn't do this in class so much, I called it 
UV star, that's just my notation. It's not standard notation necessarily. They're related to the original vector field for F of Z. They are related but different. And in terms of integrating F of Z, you've got to think in terms of integrating these vector fields. <coughs> and based on this, you should be able to look at a vector field or maybe two vector fields for these things, and predict, perhaps, whether the line integral is positive or negative, or close to zero, or maybe equal to zero even, based on how the vector field looks. For example, if your contour, say, is, is not closed, but maybe looks like that, and say this vector field, u comma negative v, um, maybe looks like this along that oriented contour. The line integral over such contour for this vector field would have to be positive. The curve is flowing with the vector field, so to speak. vector field is, generally speaking, making an angle that's acute with unit tangent vector, say, or the velocity vector of the vector field, these angles, except for this one, which I made a right angle, just to, for a little variety, are acute. I wanted that to be a right angle, at least. You can think in terms of these dot products that's giving positive contributions. The, the angle's acute, so the cosine of the angle's positive. You're getting positive contributions to the line integrals. You're going to get a positive line integral over such a curve for this vector field. I'm not saying for sure whether this vector field is that one or that one. I'm just talking about an arbitrary vector field. It's also the case, well, before I say what I'm about to say, realize f of z does not have to be analytic here. And you should still be able to think of it this way. If it's not analytic, even if the contour is closed, the integral doesn't have to be zero. f of z could be z bar. Z plus Z bar square even. Okay. Not going to be analytic over even a closed contour. The interval doesn't have to be zero. Okay, what else did I want to emphasize to him here? Remember that if F is analytic, in whatever domain gamma is sitting in, It turns out it is a theorem that f, little f, will have an antiderivative if it's analytic. We didn't prove that right away. In fact, I don't think we proved it in class. The book proves it. The book proves that if little f is analytic on a domain like this, then it will have an antiderivative on that domain. That takes proof. They, they actually proved the cauchy gorsau theorem before that in the simplified version when you assume the partial derivatives not only exist but also continuous. <clears throat> Let's say capital F is an antiderivative of little f on this domain. So capital F prime equals little f. You should also remember that the line integral can be found it's called this is zi for initial point capital I, that's not the complex number of I. ZT for terminal point. This integral, in such a situation, when little f of z is, anti, um, is analytic and therefore has an antiderivative over this domain, you can find the value of this integral by essentially the fundamental theorem of calculus. Should 
should also be able to think about what this means in terms of real and imaginary parts. Let's say the, the real part of capital F is capital U, and the imaginary part of capital F is capital V. I don't think I emphasized this in class, or if I did, it was a very short thing. I am going to emphasize it next week a bit, after the exam, more. What is the derivative of capital F? It's little f. Little f is capital F prime, which by the, what was found in the section of the derivation of the cauchy riemann equations can be written as capital U sub x, meaning partial derivative of capital U with respect to x, plus i times the partial of capital V with respect to x. And that can also be written as um, partial of v with respect to y plus i times the opposite of partial of u with respect to y. <coughs> Essentially, that was a derivation of the necessity of the cauchy riemann equations when your function is analytic. That led to the cauchy riemann equations. In other words, if little f is little u plus i little v, that means little u is capital Ux, which is also capital Vy, and little v is capital V, or capital, yeah, capital Vx, which is the same as the opposite of capital Uy. These being, again, partial derivatives here. Where am I going with this? <clears throat> because of these relations, it's going to turn out that in the case where little f is analytic, these vector fields are actually conservative. They are gradients of certain functions. The gradient of capital U is the vector field capital U sub x comma U sub y. But that, by these equations, is the same as little u comma negative v, negative little v. In other words, this vector field is the gradient of the real part of the antiderivative of little f. And the other one is the gradient of capital V. Derivative of capital, this is a capital V here. Derivative of capital V with respect to x is little v. Derivative of capital V with respect to y is little e. This is v comma little v comma little e. Making this vector field, that gradient vector field as well, conservative vector field. Thinking about putting some, I brought this up because I'm thinking about putting something related to this on the exam. The exam is going to be mostly similar to completion problems since I can't find a copy of that old exam. Three. I might put two or three problems that are not similar to completion problems, maybe something like what I'm just talking about here now. If I, if I do that, then I am planning on maybe two or three problems that are not like completion problems. Um, I will let you know in an email what types of problems they're about, what you should study to be able to do those problems. But otherwise, study the completion problems, journal problems, and um, most of the exam is going to be similar to those. I will, I will modify them a little bit in certain spots. By the way, after exam three, what I've decided is you can still write in your journal, but I'm not going to grade it anymore. So I'll, I'll assign problems, but you can do as many as you want. There won't be a ton of problems in chapter six because it will take a while to do. But you can do as many of them as you want to study for the final exam. 
So the, lab, the main focus of the last two weeks of class and then the final week is the project and the study. Right. See you on Right.